Welcome to Ash Wednesday worship. We are so thankful for your presence here tonight. We are going to have the imposition of ashes. You are very free to participate or not. And there will be four stations. We'll give you more directions later in the service. Tonight we are blessed to have the preaching ministry of one of our retired beloved pastors, the Reverend Charles Claycomb. He and his wife Martha associate with Chapel Hill, for which we are very grateful. And his sermon at 1215 in the chapel was amazing. So you're in for a blessing tonight. Before we proceed in this service, I want to invite you to join with me in a time of silent prayer for the people of Kansas City who are suffering. Yet again, another shooting. And as of last count, 22 have been injured, 13 of whom were children. And at least two deaths, according to the news. So I invite you to join with me in a time of silent prayer for all who are suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I invite you, if you're physically able, to please stand, and let's join together in our responsive call to worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the maker of everything and everyone. And we are incredibly grateful that you love us. And that even though you have created us from the dust of the earth, you have formed us, you have raised us, you have loved us, you have claimed us, you have embraced us. And on this holy night, as we reflect upon our own mortality, speak your word of life in the midst of death. By the redemptive power of your holy cross, create in us clean hearts and put a new and right spirit within us that we might respond to your love with love for you and each other. For we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our teacher, and our friend. Amen. As we remain standing, you're welcome to sit down if you need to, but as most of us remain standing, we're going to sing the Lenten hymn, Lord, who throughout these 40 days, but here's the good news. It's to the tune of Amazing Grace. So everybody knows it. Just follow the words on the screens, please.
you may be seated. It is right on this night of Ash Wednesday that we take a few moments to reflect on our own hearts, on our need for God, on our need for repentance. And so in that spirit, I invite you to join me in praying our prayer of confession, as you'll see on the screens. Let us pray. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out our transgressions, wash us thoroughly from our iniquities, and cleanse us from our sins. For we acknowledge our transgressions, and our sin is ever before us. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us spend a few moments now in silent confession. My friends, hear the good news. When we return to the Lord with all our hearts, God is gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love. Hear the good news and believe. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen and amen. As you're able, I invite you to stand to join us in singing Center. Oh Christ, be the center of our lives. Be the place we fix our eyes. Be the center of our lives. center of the universe everything was made in you Jesus breath of every living thing everyone was made for you you hold everything together you hold everything together
seated. Hear these words from the book of Joel, the second chapter. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness like blackness spread upon the mountains a great and powerful army comes their like has never been from of old nor will be again after them in ages to come yet even now says the lord return to me with all your heart with fasting with weeping and with mourning rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord, your God, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people and sanctify the congregation. Assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy between the vestibule and the altar. Let the priests and minister of the Lord weep. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, Where is their God? And hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew, the sixth chapter. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God 
for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good evening, friends. A pleasure to be with you and to share this sacred time this evening as we prepare together to enter into what we call the, the Great Lent. Would you join me in prayer? O oh, gracious God, take our minds and think through them. And O oh, God, take our lips and speak through them, and by all means, O Lord, take our hands and work through them. But tonight, on this very special occasion, take our hearts and set them on fire with love for Thee, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, today and tonight, the Christian Church of the West gathers as it does every year to recall one of its oldest symbols of faith, the imposition of ashes on the first day of the Great Lent, that day which we normally call Ash Wednesday. Our Orthodox brothers and sisters have never really followed this tradition and Lenten practice. In fact, we, we Methodist Christians only embrace this 
what was traditionally a Roman Catholic uh, event uh, back to 1964 when we decided to include it in our book of worship, although I suspect there were some more uh, creative, uh, progressive congregations even before 64 that decided to utilize this precious service. This particular service marking the beginning of the Lenten season is sometimes referred to as our Jerusalem journey. Remembering when Jesus turned his face toward Judea and began to walk toward the city of destiny. Such is an act of devotion, as an ancient sign of mortality, sorrow, penance, and purification. The Bible has a number of references to the use of ashes. Um, remember back in Genesis 18, 27, and here in this passage, Abraham is, is bargaining with God to to spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as God and as Abraham is sort of, you know, wrestling with God in a sense, obviously articulating his concern about what was what might well happen, suddenly he becomes aware of the fact that he Abraham was talking to God. And that's something you just didn't do much of in the in the Old Testament era. And with sudden awareness, he proclaims, Behold, I've taken upon myself to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. And if I might add a little bit of my own commentary, please, Lord, don't kill me now. <laughs> dust and ashes are synonymous with the word earth or Adamiah. And from this word is derived the Hebrew word Adam, the very first human being. And then in Genesis 3.19, it even makes a play on these words. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The very sentence which we echo in the Ash Wednesday service as the ashes are imposed upon us. Therefore, the elements of the service become the, the symbol of our, our mortality. They are a symbolic recognition that we are truly tied to the, to the basic stuff of the earth. Modern scientists have really taken it a step further by reminding us that every atom within every one of our human bodies was generated within the furnaces of the stars themselves in an exploding supernova. Those atoms were released. So therefore, everything we see or touch or smell or behold is really made up of star stuff, stardust if you prefer. We know that to travel into outer space, we, we must take all those elements of life, those elements of earth with us if, in fact, we expect to survive. We know that not a single thing within us is immortal unless God makes it so. The ashes that are imposed are also a symbol of our, of our repentance and our, uh, and our sorrow. In the, in the short book of Jonah in the Hebrew Bible, we read of how after hearing the prophetic message of Jonah, the king of the Ninevites responds by putting on sackcloth and ashes. He also orders that all the people of his city do the same, and he even orders that all the animals be covered in ashes and sackcloth. And the, boldly, and the king boldly proclaims that he's not immortal, but he e even equally proclaims his repentance before God. Job makes use of, of ashes when he realizes his own human limitation in the face of God's infinite power. He uses dust and ashes to symbolize the intensity of his repentance. Yes, my friends, I think we just have to come into a service like this one and declare our need together, our community need, that we do indeed need God. The great truth of our human condition today is that we have a very difficult time admitting our finitude and any human limitation, let alone the fact that we might accept our own human mortality. 
We sort of have this idea. We can do anything. We can do everything if you just give us enough time. Perhaps in a moment like this one, the ashes of this service can remind us of our ultimate and complete and, yes, utter dependence upon Almighty God. Yes, we have to know in the core of our being that we are mortal creatures. We come from the dust of the earth, and yes, in time, these bodies that we're occupying and even all the things that we may have proudly created over the course of our life will someday have to be returned to the source, to the stuff of the earth. And yet it's equally vital that we also remember that we are given a precious divine gift, a gift found in a word that proclaims the extravagant love and grace from our God who exists in the space between all things great and small, who holds us and everything else together and absolutely refuses to let us go. Yes, my friends, listen to these words, for they are so essential to my message tonight. God does indeed dwell in the inner space between the atoms and the tiniest subatomic particles, just as God dwells in the great space between the galaxies. And yes, of course, God is found in the intimate space between every creature, including every man, woman, and child who has ever lived on the face of this earth. Behold the very God of the ages, known to us in Jesus Christ, is absolutely holding us all together in love. Amen and amen. Ashes also symbolize our own sorrow. Historically, whenever people would grieve, they would cover themselves in ashes. And then they would sometimes render their clothing and tear them as a way to declare their, their grief and their sadness. My wife is, is from Greece and in her home country. When you lose a loved one, you, you don black and you wear that for a, a definite period of time. We always need to be aware of our grief, our loss. We need to feel our sorrow and let us allow the ashes of this moment to become a healing balm of comfort comfort, even as we might pray, dear Lord God, move us beyond our pain. The imposition of the ashes were also seen down through the ages as being a symbol of purification. While we don't necessarily believe that ashes in themselves have any particular power to purify us from our sin, only the Lord is going to do that. But such an act of piety can remind us of the cleansing power of Jesus Christ, especially as it might be stamped upon our faces in the pattern and shape of the cross. So as much as we might want to be tempted this year on this Valentine's Day to, to make not the shape of the cross but the shape of a heart on our faces, no, we, we still need the cross a redemption. So no, there will not be any shaping of hearts on our foreheads tonight. Therefore, let us in this moment, inside this holy place, receive these symbols of penance, mortality, sorrow, and purification. And as we mark the beginning of Lent this year, let us recall the text of last Sunday when when we recall how Peter and James and John descended the mountain after witnessing that amazing transfiguration of Jesus. For this was that precise moment when, when our Lord came down and set his face toward Jerusalem and all together they walked forward to answer God's call upon their lives. With the cross marked upon their faces, let us now begin the great Lent. And let us begin as we pray that the journey which begins in cold, dead ashes 
might become a blazing fire of faith and life within us. Let our Jerusalem journey begin right now. Amen. Today we begin a spiritual journey that will span 40 days from Ash Wednesday until the Sunday before Easter. In the early days of the church, the season of Lent was a time of preparation for those who were preparing for baptism on Easter Sunday. Since these new members were to be received into a living community of faith, the entire community was called to preparation. Today, the season of Lent is a time of prayer, fasting, self-examination, and penitence for all Christians as we prepare to celebrate Easter. Through this 40-day journey, we are reminded that we are totally dependent upon God. This season reminds us how much we need grace in order for our lives to be transformed and reflective of God's love. We are called to renew our commitments and our faith as we continually acknowledge our need for God's presence with us. We are invited to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. To make a right beginning of repentance, I invite each of us now to ask God to examine our hearts as we worship together. Let us have a time of silent prayer and reflection. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality, so that we may remember that only by your gracious gift we are given everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. In a moment, we're going to invite you to come forward and to receive the imposition of ashes. Traditionally, it's done on the forehead. Some people prefer the hands and others prefer the head. If you would like to receive the imposition of ashes other than the forehead, please make that known to the pastor at whose station you go forward for imposition. So there will be four stations. We're not doing this like communion. You don't have to go to the pastor in front of your section. Please spread out. If you would like to kneel as you receive the imposition, then go to the stations that are on the edges. Pastor Jennifer and I will be in the center. Pastor Charles, Pastor Ben will be on the, the edges of the sanctuary. And as we make movement, please be careful and watch your step. But come as the Spirit leads. There will be no formal row by row. As this music washes over you, respond as the Spirit leads.
this pain I wonder if I'll ever find my way I wonder if my life could really change at all All this earth Could all that is lost ever be could a garden come up from this ground at all? You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dead.
you 
Certainly, I want to express appreciation tonight to Pastor Jeff and all the pastoral staff for the invitation that they gave me to be your preacher for the night. I always consider such a moment as this to be a great and high honor. I also, whenever I'm asked to, um, to preach anywhere, whether it's at a, at a wedding or a funeral or whatever the occasion, I always consider that a, a profound honor and uh, something that I should take seriously. But whenever I'm asked to do such a thing, I'm, I'm obviously uh, uh, perplexed as to what I should say. And, and I'm reminded of, you know, that old expression, what, what would Jesus do or what would, what would Jesus say if he suddenly could just materialize in our midst and offer the sermon for the night? I, I kind of wonder what it would be. I, I have no, I wouldn't even pretend to know what it would be, but I'm confident it would be so far superior to anything I could come up with that there's no comparison. But I'm absolutely confident that Jesus would use a word, a particular word. And the reason I'm so confident in that he would use this word is because he used it every day of his life. He used it as a way to say good morning when he greeted his friends and disciples. He used the same word at the end of the day to say good night or farewell. He most particularly used this word when, when people were absolutely hysterically uh, frightened, when they were terrified, such as the time they were in the boat, remember, and the storm brewed up, and, and he knew, everybody knew they were going to drown except for Jesus who was over there asleep. And so they went over and woke him up and said, Lord, don't you, don't you care that we're about to die? And Jesus woke up and he shook the sleep out of his eyes and he said, he said this word, he said shalom, which is a Hebrew word which means the peace of God that passes all understanding. It is the gospel incarnate in a word, the peace of God that passes all understanding. So I'm absolutely confident that if Jesus were here tonight in the flesh, he would say to us, shalom. And so that's the word I would like to leave you with tonight as we prepare the journey to Jerusalem the journey of the great Lent, the path that takes us forward. Shalom, my friends. Shalom, my friends. Shalom, shalom. We'll see you again. Yes, we'll see you again. Shalom, shalom. I would ask you tonight as you leave that we might leave together in a spirit of silence.